Hello, and welcome to Training the Next Generation of Open Source Developers. My name is Jeremy, and I'm the Director of Technical Community at Datadog. If you have any questions or want to follow up after the talk, uh, hit me up at, at Linux Questions on Twitter. And I'd like to, this to be as interactive as possible, so don't be shy. I know we are pre-recording this, but I'll be there for the live QA and have left plenty of time for you to ask questions at the end and would love for you to implement a program similar to this at your organization organization when this is over, so would like to answer any questions that you may have along the way. With that said, let's get started. So what is Datadog? And I do want to note here that this is in no way a product pitch in any way, shape, or form, but the product really is part of the story, so having just a little bit of an understanding of what the product is will really help you understand the storyline. So. Now, we're a platform for modern analytics and monitoring and designed to help you understand your entire stack, uh, especially if you're in the cloud, but even if you're on a more traditional infrastructure. And just to give you a little bit of the idea of the scale that we're at, we're processing trillions of data points a day, so solving really interesting problems at scale. And there you go. Uh, we think of our services uh, as enabling observability through a variety of tools that are built on top of our platform. So you have your traditional infrastructure monitoring and metrics, you have distributed tracing and APM, you have logs, you have synthetics, and we've recently added uh, additional features such as networking and RUM and security. So a very comprehensive platform to enable, enable observability. And you might commonly uh, hear these called uh, the pillars of observability within the industry. Uh, so that should give you a little bit of an idea of what we do as a product. So with that, uh, this is usually a slide that you see at the end we're hiring. And, and while we really are hiring, the reality is that even in these difficult times, many tech companies are accelerating their hiring. And in the long term, I think in the technical industry, recruiting is always going to be a difficult problem. Uh, so uh, you, normally, this is where I'd say, hey, raise your hand if you're not hiring. Can't do that here, but I think you get the idea. And, and the reality beyond that is we're all using open source. Sometimes I have to explain that a little bit. Obviously, here at Open Source Summit, I don't think that I need to, right? Open stores at this point is just table stakes. Um, but the more we talk to candidates that were coming out of university, we realized that they actually didn't have solid open source experience. They didn't understand the fundamentals of open source. Uh, they didn't have the philosophical interest that many developers have had in the past. And they just didn't, also didn't have a lot of observability experience. But on the open source side, we found that this really made roles focused on open source really challenging to hire for, especially at the more junior side of the scale. And that's something that we wanted to directly address. So with that in mind, I want to set up a little bit about how open source works at Datadog. So we are a proprietary SaaS product. But like most companies these days, we have a huge, huge focus on open source, and I'm going to explain that a little bit more. So all of our agents, all of our libraries, anything basically that runs on your infrastructure is going to be completely open source for us. So typically it's going to be Apache 2, but we also have some BSD and some MIT as well. Uh, but we also, in addition to all of that being open source, we release quite a bit of open source based on problems that we've solved internally. So one example of this is Kafka Kit, which we open sourced last year. And that's a great example. It's uh, some tooling that enabled us to scale Kafka really well. And we found a large community growing around that. So not only uh, releasers of open source as far as the product goes, but also some additional tooling as well. Beyond that, we rely on a ton of open source, and I'm sure this is the same with your organization. You know, I've kind of highlighted Kafka and Kubernetes and Postgres Go here. If I tried to include the logo for every open source project that we use realistically, it would not be a, a readable slide. Uh, but like I said, I imagine this is the same for your organization. Increasingly, open source is just important for everyone. Uh, we also contribute upstream where it makes sense. So whether that is helping others scale as we've scaled or making things more observable for the project or just regular bug fixes, performance improvements. We very much have an upstream first mentality as you should too. 
beyond just open source though, we believe in open standards as well. Uh, so we recently, as an example here, contributed all of our tracers and auto instrumentation to the Open Telemetry Project. For those of you not familiar with Open Telemetry, they provide you know libraries, agents, and other components that you need to capture telemetry data for your services. And, and that's gonna give you better observability, allow you to manage things better, allow you to debug things better. And it was the result of the merging of two open source projects, uh, Open Tracing and Open Census. So across the board, the, the point here is that we are huge supporters of open source and open standards. And it's really important to us that we are good open source citizens throughout that. Uh, one last thing I should note here, if you are an open source project and you don't currently have an observability solution, we do offer free, uh, absolutely no strings attached, no charge, uh, Datadog to open source projects. And this runs the gamut. It's a program that we started a few years back that I currently lead. And we have everything from Apache Software Foundation and Python Software Foundation, so large foundations we donate to, also all the way down to very small projects. So if this is a need that you have and you're an open source project, uh, do contact me and let me know and we're happy to help you out there. So with uh, open source at Datadog and why the, this is important to us out of the way, Let's, I would like to cover just briefly a little bit about me and why I think you should listen to, to this talk. Uh, I consider myself an ardent but realistic open source advocate, and I think that realistic part is, is really important. But beyond the principles of open source that I do genuinely believe in, I also recognize that open source has accelerated my career. You know, I started using Linux in the very early days, uh, ironically a little bit looking for a SCO alternative. Um, I founded a website called linuxquestions.org, which is the largest distribu distribution independent Linux community on the web. And it has been you know, a, a really fun ride. We're gonna, in the next week or so here, hit our 20 year anniversary. So something that I've been doing for a while. I was an early podcaster, mostly around open source and, and technology in general. Uh, but I think most importantly, probably for this particular talk, I lead the open source programs office at, at Datadog. And the reality here is my life would be very different if it weren't for open source. And as I talked to other people in the organization, I realized that there was quite a few of us that felt the same way. And we kind of wanted to pay it forward and ensure that other engineers and newer engineers had the same opportunities that we have and could be positively impacted by open source. So one of the first things we did is, is good open source citizens. We looked around to see what other organizations were there. And the same with code, there's no reason to start something from scratch if you can build on something that's already existing. I, I put a couple examples in the slide here, Outreachy, Summer of Code, OSL. And the, the reality here is these are all great projects. We actually still participate in some of them. But for what we were specifically trying to do here, they just weren't a fit for that. So we did decide to launch something new. So what we launched was the Datadog open source co-op program. This is typically a 15 to 20 ish week uh, paid internship. And that's an important part of this is they get full remuneration, full benefits, the same as if they were a full-time employee at the organization. So they are, there's not like a different tier for them. They are, are full employees and that's very important. So what did they actually do? So one of their main goals is specifically to work on upstream open source projects. And I'm gonna get into a little bit of the details there and I'll explain why I've, I've included these logos in a few minutes. So the main goal is to identify, report, and then fix performance issues and meaningful bugs in open source projects and do that upstream. We skew towards what we consider impactful projects and, and how we kind of define that internally are things that are technically interesting for the co-op, which is really important, but also things that we use a, as an organization. So that's where you get the benefits to both sides. Uh, after that, we write about the experience on our engineering blog and, and we found that written communication skills are vastly underappreciated by new engineers, a skill that I think is super important. It helps you clarify your thoughts, helps you solidify lessons learned, and it also enables you to share all things that I think are super important. Uh, the key difference between some of the other programs though here is we wanted to make it relevant to the business uh, so that we could make it sustainable, something that we could do long-term, something that we could do at scale. And so we have them do this all with Datadog, the product. So if this is gonna be successful, a, a core piece really is that it has to be beneficial for the students and really meaningfully, meaningfully beneficial. So what does that mean in practice? Uh, some of the benefits that I'll cover, they gain real world experience in engineering uh, that's publicly referenceable. And I think that last part is what's truly important. You know, there's a lot of great uh, internship 
opportunities around. But a lot of times what happens is you're going to say, I, work at, I worked at company X and worked on project Y. And that's about all the details that you can give. Where in the case of our internship here, because it is all open source, it is all upstream, you can say I worked on project X. Here are the PRs that I submitted. So not only can you see my technical solution, you can see how I responded to review code reviews. You can see how I interacted with other people. You can see how my thought process iter iterated as I got more and more involved. So it's a pretty comprehensive picture of what you worked on, all publicly referenceable, which we think is a pretty unique benefit that we haven't seen a, a lot elsewhere. Uh, you're going to learn about what open source is and why it's important. And, and it's a huge, huge piece of that you're going to see. How do you engage with open source communities? You know, open source communities, especially some of them, have a little bit of a reputation for being a little bit intimidating. And having someone that is familiar with that community to mentor you through the process has been really critical for this program and has been a huge benefit directly to the students. And the last thing I'll cover there as a student benefit is you build your reputation in the open source community. And this has a couple of knock-on benefits. Uh, one is it just straight makes you more employable in the long term, which is obviously huge. But uh, and on the other hand, it also allows you to work with a bunch of different projects to see what type of projects resonate with you. And just importantly, what kind of projects don't. Now, the other side of that coin is it has to also be beneficial to the organization if it's going to be sustainable for the long term. So uh, what, what benefits has Datadog seen and why are we doing this? Well, one, that raises our open source profile. As I said, we use a ton of open source. We release a ton of open source. We want to be good open source citizens and genuinely give back to a community that's given us a lot. And this enables us to do that. Uh, it allows us to, to, I guess, pardon the pun, dog food our own products. And what I mean by that is a lot of co-ops come out, of, uh, especially where Waterloo and some of the other organizations that we work with closely are great engineering schools. The people that come out of them are super technical and have a lot of technical skill. They don't have a lot of open source skill, like I said, and they might not have a bunch of observability experience. So if they're running into onboarding problems with our product, it's very likely that other customers are also running into those same onboarding issues. So having someone that we can work with to identify those problems and solve them has been really beneficial for us as well. And lastly, the recruiting pipeline. And there's kind of two things that I'll, I'll mention very briefly here. Uh, one is the obviously we hope to recruit the people that are going through this co-op program. But in addition to that, it also allows us to show the great things that we're working on and kind of expose our culture to a bunch of open source product projects. And that also helps us with that recruiting pipeline. So two benefits there. So now that I've covered, I think, why this is comprehensively beneficial to everyone, I want to get into a case study, this one involving Andrew McBurney. So uh, he is from Waterloo, which is one organization that we work with quite a bit. And before he joined as a, as a co-op as part of this program, he had a little bit of experience in the open source world, had kind of looked at a couple projects, but he really wanted to dig in and learn more. Uh, he joined us in his junior year in 2018. And as the first co-op as part of this program, he would need to prove that the concept was viable, that it was beneficial to him, that it was beneficial for the organization, and really that we should continue doing this long term. Long term. And uh, happy to say the story has a happy ending. He, uh, we still have the program, and uh, he actually works at Datadog full-time as an engineer now. So all the way around, the story ends well. So as I mentioned, part of the... Um, objective of this is to find meaningful performance or bugs or issues, uh, use Datadog to find and fix that, and then get that fix not only submitted but accepted upstream. So Andrew identified a performance issue in Homebrew, and for those of you who use Homebrew specifically in the linkage command. Now, here is the, the part of the PR that he initially submitted. Aside from the fact that you can see here, Andrew is very Canadian. Uh, one great thing here is that we use data, uh, Brew internally at Datadog quite a bit. So this is where I was mentioning there's a direct impact to us, but also something that we can share with the broader open source community. So here is a, a flame graph from Brew Linkage before Andrew submitted the PR. And here is the PR, uh, this is a, excuse me, this is a flame graph from after the PR was um, merged. It's a little difficult to tell here exactly what's happening. You can tell there's an improvement, but let me get into some specifics. So with no caching at all, brew linkage took roughly eight seconds to run. 
Now, he initially used SQLite, but this introduced an additional dependency into the project and is something that the project did not like. And this was a great lesson learned for him and something that we mentored him through after the fact that you need to really, before you just start submitting a PR to a new open source project, you, you need to understand what their norms are. I kind of explained it as you should participate a little bit in read-only mode first. This was something that was documented. So had he looked around a little bit more, it's something that he would have discovered and some Something that I think was an actionable takeaway for him. But moving to the solution that was actually accepted, which was based on DBM and did not introduce any additional dependencies, you can see here that it took about a tenth of a second longer to run on the first time, and that's of course while the cache is being built, but subsequent runs are quite a bit faster uh, on the order of 200 milliseconds, so quite a performance win. Now with that PR accepted and merged, it's time to write about the experience in the solution for our engineering blog, which was where we share a lot of our engineering stories with the broader community. Now, one thing that was interesting to me here is that Andrew enjoyed this process much more than he anticipated. And he actually noted that learning about the importance of writing was one of the biggest surprises of his time here at Datadog. And, and I kind of underscored the importance of written communication skills before and how underappreciated they are. So this for me was personally very satisfying. And I thought it was great that it was something that he took with him and I'm quite sure will benefit him for the rest of his career. So what else did he work on? So you'll probably recognize DGraph, you might recognize Fastplane, but what is Jello? So the great thing about Jello is it's internal tooling that we've open sourced, but the part that I really like is it's something that Andrew identified as an inefficiency in our internal processes. Uh, he worked on his own across teams to fix it and then released it as open source. So the resulting Trello GitHub integration is now I know being used at other organizations, which is great to see. Also something that's interesting is other co-ops after him have also worked on it. Uh, and actually our, our co-op right now, Ursula, is porting it to Jira, which is something, a change that we've made internally. So it's great to see both a community starting to form around it and subsequent co-ops also working on it to give the program a little bit of continuity there. So what did he learn? Uh, one, how to interact with upstream communities. And as I've kind of said uh, earlier in this talk, uh, some open source communities especially have a reputation for you know, being a little bit intimidating, but even the super uh, welcoming ones, and there are many, if you're new to it and haven't done it before, it's something that it, you're not gonna really know the ins and outs and having a mentor to walk you through, here's the technical part of it, here's the people part of it, all the different aspects that are involved with open source, Having someone to mentor you through that product was something that he really took away from this. Now, he, of course, he learned a ton about uh, modern microservices, distributed systems, modern infrastructure, cloud, et cetera. Like I said, we're solving a lot of cool problems at scale and him having production experience there, and we, he, we do kind of throw you right into production, is, is something that he, a lesson learned and something that he was able to take away. This is a small one. He learned an additional programming language. Obviously, if you know a couple, learning an additional one is not a huge thing, but it was something that he said he enjoyed the process of, especially under the conditions that the program facilitated. The importance of making data-driven decisions, and, and this was a big one. I know data is in our name, and we are a very data-driven company, and I showed you a little chart and a couple flame graphs, but the amount of data he used to iterate on the different solutions as he was working through the technical side of this problem was huge, and it's something that he noted uh, that was a huge takeaway for him was how important making those data-driven de decisions were, and not just saying, I think this is going to be a better solution, but actually proving not only is it a better solution, this is how much of a better solution solution it is and having numbers to back that up. Uh, his next co-op actually ended up being working on one of the projects that he contributed to while at Datadog. So this isn't maybe specifically a lesson learned, but something that he was really happy with and a takeaway from the program. And the last thing he learned is the importance of a positive work environment. I think, you know, this is really a great place to work. We have a really great culture. And he noted that it was something that he didn't realize how important that was. And as he was, as was exposed to some other places, he realized that it was something super important to him personally and identified as one of the reasons that he joined us full time about a little over a year later. So with that out of the way, I want to cover some of the challenges. And by challenges, I want to cover challenges for him, challenges for us as an organization, and some challenges for the program itself. So I'm going to lump these into some broader categories. The first one I'll lump into what I'll call onboarding. And so Andrew went through the same onboarding as all engineers do here. 
I identified earlier that we were finding that folks coming out of these were, didn't have the open source experience uh, that maybe uh, we would like, but we, I think we underappreciated just how much of an additional crash, crash course they would need on the open source side, something that we've since identified and are much better about in subsequent co-ops, but something that you can learn from us. Uh, Another challenge is working through the what I'll call the vagaries of different open source projects and the communities that he was interested in. As I said, uh, every open source community is going to be a little bit different and mentoring him through that was just a, generally a challenge. Certainly not one that's insurmountable, one that you will definitely come up against and just more of something that you should definitely be aware of. Now the last one I'll, I'll cover as part of onboarding is Helping him understand the value of the program to the organization. This is one that I'll be honest, we did not anticipate in any way, shape or form, but we have a lot of co-ops from Waterloo and a lot of his other, you know, he was friends with some of them. As they were submitting PRs to the product itself, it was a more clear, here's a direct line I'm, I'm committing to the project. I'm sorry, to the product, where he was working on upstream open source. He didn't really have a good understanding and we didn't do a good job, to be frank, explaining to him why this program was super beneficial to us as an organization, not just to him. Once we were able to explain that to him and he really understood it, it recharged him completely. A morale shot way up and he would under, once he understood it, he was super happy and continued with it. But so something that you should be aware of if you're going to implement this at your organization. The next group that I'll cover, I'll lump into setting expectations, and this is going to kind of become a, a recurring theme. Uh, right after he joined, he we sat down with him and he discussed kind of a list of things that he was interested in from a technical perspective, projects that he had identified based on us telling him what he was going to be doing that he might be interested in working on. And the thing to understand here is they're going to be optimistic possibly wildly optimistic. Uh, your job is to be realistic. So if they want to work on Kubernetes as a whole or Rails as a whole, probably not a great fit given the time constraints and complexity of those projects. A lot of eyes on those projects, a lot of people working on them. So what you need to do is set realistic goals uh, and that's really, really important. So setting those expectations, both in terms of those goals, but defining what success is, is really important for a co-op program. Waterloo is a specific example, has a very rigorous rubric for grading their co-ops. And if they don't understand exactly what success looks like, they're not going to understand how they're graded, which is going to be terrifying for them given how the program works. So we wanted to make sure we he understood, okay, here's what you'll the kind of the what success looks like for you and here's how you actionably attain that success. The next things uh, challenges I'll lump into what I call false starts. So even if you put in the work to pick a project well, some projects that may initially seem like they're going to be a good fit for a variety of reasons may end up not being as good a fit as you had hoped for. And this might be the issue that you identified and you wanted to fix was fixed by someone else before you were able to submit it. It might be a problem that seemed pretty easy to fix, ends up being intractable, especially with that time box that you have. The important thing to consider here is that's okay. In fact, you can use it as a very good learning experience, but what's important here is that you understand when to move on and allow that co-op to time box that effort, realize that it's not going to happen, but it was a lesson learned and that it's fine to move on. Uh, while I'm speaking of false starts, go Bills. Uh, the next group of challenges I will lump into maintainer and project responsiveness. So one thing that we failed at is we didn't work with projects well enough ahead of time so that they knew that this was coming. Uh, Google Summer of Code, for example, does a phenomenal job here and is actually we've modeled how we handle this now much more in that frame. But you projects aren't if they don't know that you have someone working on this they're just not going to you know be able to accommodate it a lot of times based on how open source projects work and part of that is their timelines and your timelines they're just not going to be aligned right you have 16 or 20 weeks exactly to do this that doesn't fit in with their timelines or how they do sprints or how they do releases so very important to reach out to projects ahead of time let them know how the program works. Let them know that someone from the program is interested in contributing. See what issues they think would be a good fit for them to work on and then work on those. The, another thing I'll mention here is kind of the variance of response times in open source projects is high. And it's not only high from project to project, but it's high 
for specific projects individually over a time, right? So things within a project may change, maintainers move on, maintainers change, maintainers get busy. So understanding that it's gonna be variant, that's how it is, that's just the, the reality of it. Baking that into the, pr the process is gonna be super important. Uh, and lastly, I'll cover length of program. Getting everything done in a compressed time frame can be frustrating for the co-op and that's the reality of it. So once again, you're gonna have to be super deliberate about time boxing things. And because of that, you need to plan very well. And this is gonna come right back to setting expectations is super important. Like I said, there's a theme here. If there's one thing you take away from this, the importance of setting expectations across the board, both with the co-op, with the organization, with the program, critical, absolutely critical to success. So with those challenges out of the way, I want to let you know and give you some tips on how you can apply this to your organization now and some lessons learned along the way so you can not make the mistakes that we've already made. So number one, and these are obviously going to come directly from the challenges that we faced. Uh, engage with maintainers and projects and do this ahead of time. Be super deliberate about explaining what, this, what your project is, how much time you have, what your goals are as an organization. Make sure that it's a good fit for you, a good fit for the project, and then work together collaboratively so that you're setting the co-op up for success. Next, uh, write the story as you go. And this one I think is really important and, and probably going to be underappreciated. But like I said, writing the story down, written communication skills in general, help you clarify your thoughts, help you cement lessons learned, and really enables others to learn from you, which is the entire part of our engineering blog and most engineering blogs is you want to share those stories. But doing it well takes more time than most people realize. And I think starting early, part of what it does is ensures that you're documenting things along the way so that they're fresh in your mind. Uh, but also, to be frank, hopefully it enables you to finish on time. And in Andrew's case, his post actually wasn't published until after his co-op ended, which is something that we worked very hard to ensure didn't happen again. Uh, next, the length of the program impacts success directly. And we work with a lot of schools. I've mentioned, uh, obviously, Waterloo specifically a few times. We also work with Northwestern. We work with a couple of universities in Europe. And they tend to have 16-week or 20-week programs. And we found that that's enough time to really, really get something done and dig into a couple of different projects, write about it, get it posted, et cetera. We've, we've found that some of the summer internships where you're getting four or maybe even eight weeks, it's just not enough for a program like this. For our goals, if your goals are different, it might be that it fits, but we've just found that it is realistically not enough time. Uh, mentoring, speaking of time, takes time. Uh, especially, you know, at Datadog, we are a pretty distributed organization, uh, but helping a co-op evaluate a project, then picking a project, then mentoring through the technical challenges that they're going to run into, the open source processes that they're going to run into, the human elements that they're going to run into, all of this takes time. So if you don't have the time to do this well, realistically, I would recommend you not institute something like this, but hopefully you can make that time and do it well. Uh, but it's just something... Don't underestimate the time that it's going to take for this to be a rewarding experience for the co-op. And why I mention is this, this is a great, great opportunity to get more people involved in open source. What you don't want to do is do it poorly and then sour people on open source. Uh, you know, that would just be, I think, an opportunity lost. So in conclusion, four students to date have finished the co-op program. There you see Andrew, but also uh, Taylor, Shiva, and uh, Chelsea, who have gone through it. I mentioned Ursula, who's on the team now, uh, currently working on a couple of cool things that hopefully we'll have some PRs for soon. But we've submitted dozens of PRs across dozens of different open source projects. Uh, all four co-ops have, have said that they've really enjoyed it and found it beneficial. They're all still interested in open source, which is something that's been super satisfying for us as an organization, super uh, satisfying for me individually. And I think that you can implement something like this in your organization. So as I said, I've left plenty of time for questions and would love to hear specific thoughts on how you might implement it. If you're doing something similar to this, would love to hear your lessons learned and we can learn and share collaboratively together. Thanks.
Thank you for joining me for training the next generation of open source developers. As I said, my name is Jeremy, and that was the story of how we implemented an open source co-op program at Datadog. There was a couple of questions that came in during the session that I answered via text. If you do have any other questions, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of time to, uh, thank you, Steve, a little bit of time to get them in. But if not, uh, as I is, is on the slide here, I'm at Linux questions. Happy to help you in any way I can implement this at your organization. Once again, an absolutely great way to mentor and foster open source uh, um, amongst the next generation of, of developers. So with that, appreciate it. And, and thanks again for coming to the talk. Uh, question from Joe was, do you have any tips on the specific angle arguments that should be used to get students excited about open source? So I think there are a couple of, of different things that you can uh, underscore and utilize in, that are in their benefit there. One is open source is obviously a great way to learn about different technologies, get exposed to different programming languages, different methodologies, see what uh, is happening in the industry. But again, I think that one of the big things that I would underscore to students specifically, because that part is obviously broadly applicable, is that this is a way for them to work on projects and have the next people that are going to be hiring them be able to see how they deal with code, how they deal with code reviews, how they deal with interpersonal skills, how their thought processes iterate. These are all things that in any other co-op program uh, if they weren't open source, you would not be able to showcase those things. So being able to almost have an open source portfolio when you're going to, you know, going through the hiring process is going to be really critical and something that multiple co-ops here have said has been super beneficial to them as they've gone through the process. So great question, Joe. Appreciate it. And once again, I will upload the, the slides there, uh, which was the question from, from Alpesh. Uh, so it looks like that is all the questions we had. Once again, if you think of a question or are watching this on replay and would like to ask a question, hit me up at, at Linux questions and happy to help you out. Thanks again. Bye.